All right, so we are going to move on, learn some more information, try to knock out the rest of this. Looks like we're pretty close, 83. We only got about 20 slides left in the P information. So, and we're going to start with the topic which I most forget the details of. All right, so the, that's interesting. This animation is broken, but um, starting from the data directory, going to index 012, we've got the resource directory. And I had mentioned the resources briefly before. We had shown them briefly before. Resources are information like icons that are embedded into the file. Uh, in the case of Stuxnet, it's you know the exploits and DLLs that they want to inject. They carry that around in the resource section. You can kind of think like the resources as its own little mini file system because it's got a well-structured way of finding your way to all of these independent uh, sort of files that are tacked on to the end of, uh, end of the binary itself proper. And so there's programmatic ways to access each of these files. There's APIs that you'll call to get resource with a particular ID and things like that. So you as a programmer will put resources into your uh, executable and then you'll, you know, read them up and use them as necessary. All right, well, so from the data directory, there's just a standard entry and then that points at the resource directory as given right here. Actually, I've got to write this down. I'm going to fix this slide because otherwise I won't notice. So in the resource directory, this first top-level structure, there's going to be just one of these and then it's going to be uh, having an array of other data structures after it. So things we care about, there's a time date stamp here, but that's not actually going to have anything, so uh, that's not going to matter. Things we care about is the number of named entries and number of ID entries. So the resources, sometimes they'll have an actual name and sometimes they'll just have an ID number essentially. And so you can look up things by ID or look up things by name when you're accessing your own resources programmatically. Uh, so immediately following the resource directory, there's going to be an array of, uh, of structures, these resource directory entry structures. So we start with the resource directory and then we've got an array of the resource directory entries immediately after it where the number of entries are the number of named entries plus the number of ID entries. Um, and as it says here, the resources can be identified name or ID, but not both. So here's the nice, terrible, uh, unionized thing that makes it very hard to just uh, naturally read the things. But basically how you can think of this is that we've got um, so it's reusing this, this resource directory entry. It's going to reuse the same data structure for each of these things that are after the uh, resource directory. And then it's going to interpret it differently depending on whether some, whether most significant bits are set or not. And so I think the easiest way is really just to show it. Uh, so yeah, so it's simpler than it looks. Just think of it as the first D word in this entry. If the most significant bit is one, which means if you're looking at it in hex, the most you'll have an eight as the uh, highest nibble. It means that the lower 31 bits are an offset to a string, uh, which gives the name of the resource. So in this case, you'd say if this, so this is something that you may not necessarily be familiar with, but in C, you can have bit fields. So uh, it's saying, you know, if, so there's 31 bits right here, and then there's a one bit that says name is string. And basically, if this name is string bit is set to one, then you're going to have that this thing is basically just a pointer to some other string. And this D word name would be interpreted as an RVA pointing out to some other string. Uh, if the most significant bit is not set, then we're talking about that it's going to be a word sized ID. So if you've got a zero in your most significant bit, then this overall D word should basically be treated as a ID for a particular resource. So that's for the first D word of information. So we said there's this kind of thing which has these bit fields. And then there's the second D word of information which is uh, here it's the name, here it's a different union. And so we can expect that in this different union if the most significant bit is set, it's going to be a uh, directory kind of. And that's why I said you can kind of think of it like a file system. It's a directory which is going to hold more data structures underneath it, for instance. All right? So if the most significant bit of the second D word is set, that means the lower 32, the lower 31 bits 
are offset to another image resource directory. So this the, that's the high level uh, data structure. So I, I kind of misdescribed it in saying there's only one image resource directory. There's the one starting one, but then there can be other ones nested lower down. But it's not like you have an array of them or anything like that. It's like you've got a starting one and then you've got kind of a tree going on, potentially like a file system tree. All right, so let's just show an example. Okay, and I don't have slides for the example, so let's just show an example for real. So this is where CFF Explorer really will shine, basically, because you don't have to look through all these bit fields. You just have nice little collapsible resources and things like that. But let's look at it the nasty way first. Let's look at it with PE view. All right, looks like this thing has some resources attached to it, whatever this is, this round eight thing, so something with TLS. All right, so the very first thing is an image resource directory. And so we see, here's the information, see time date stamp is nothing. And then uh, if we, wait, okay, so, and then there's the number of entries, named entries, and the number of ID entries. There'll be that many entry structures immediately after it, right? So we, we add up zero and one, and we get one ID entry immediately after. And so the way it's going to work usually is that you'll have the named entries and then any ID entries. So most, so now we just have like it's a nasty looking unionized and bit mapped structure, but really each of those entries is just two D words. And so in this case, the first D word, the most significant bit is set to zero, which as we said on the previous slide, if it's set to one, it points to a string. If it's set to zero, just treat it as an ID, right? So that's for the first one. And the next one, if the most significant bit is one, treat it as a pointer to another directory. So we're going to have another one of these data structures. Otherwise, I don't know, what did I say what the case is if it's the most significant bit, not one. It's set. And if it's not set, it means it's the actual data which I'll actually be following. Most significant bit is not set, that means it's an offset to the actual data. So basically, on the second D word, if the most significant bit is not set, that means you've kind of reached the leaf node. It's saying this second D word points at the real data. But if it doesn't point at the real data, it points at another data structure, which will give you another branch of the tree, basically. All right, so this is kind of how you'd have to dig down to it. So we take the most significant bit. And the other things I should say is that this is the other case where we've got RVAs, which are not relative to the base. They're actually relative to the start of the resource information. So when I say this is the offset to a directory and I say it's the most significant bit is set, so just chop off the top one bit and treat the rest as an offset. The offset is 18, but it's 18 not from the beginning, but from the start of all of this uh, resource information. So you can see we have zero and then we go one, four. And so you'd basically expect it to be tacked on right now down here. And indeed, if we go down here, we see that you know starting at one eight, that's the next directory. And then we go down and there's another directory and then we go down and here's an actual thing where the most significant bit is not set to one. Therefore, it's just the offset to the real data. And so at offset 48, here's the real data and it's, it's saying it's going to be a manifest type. And so it's interpreted it here. So realistically, uh, we don't like to have to deal with it like this ever, if at all possible. And you really shouldn't ever have to, but I put in there just sort of for completeness so that you recognize that is this crazy union struct, but it's really just two different ways of looking stuff. First D word, it's either uh, a string or, or uh, ID. Second D word, it's either a pointer to a directory or a pointer to the data. All right, so let's look at it the nice way. The nice way is with CFF Explorer. I think this is the same thing even. And so in CFF Explorer, you just click on the resource directory and you can see that if you click on the top level resource directory, there you go. There's your data structure that's saying it has one ID entry next, and so that would be this entry right here. And this entry, because the most significant bit on this first thing is set, that means this entry is going to have an offset one eight to the next entry. And so we click that, and we see a new directory, and that's at offset one eight, and so forth. And we go down, right? And the thing is, we don't even really want to look at it like this. <laughs> this is even worse than it has to be. What we really want to look at it with is, or is it resource editor? So this is the nice way where it'll actually be parsing this stuff. So we said that there's like all of these directories, there's multiple level directories that actually are only terminating at a single thing that calls itself manifest. It's actually a manifest file that just has to do with uh, 
compilation. It's a file generated automatically by Visual Studio compiler. So this is a very simple case. And you know, we can find there's basically this one text file essentially embedded into it. Now let's look at a more interesting case, which is the Process Explorer that I was telling you about before. So Process Explorer, right? This is the thing that we run, and it will show us all the different running processes in a hierarchy view, and it'll show us DLLs if we run it as administrator. But what I claimed before is that in its resources, this exe actually has a well-formed kernel driver, which it dumps out of its kernel, uh, out of its resources, and then it goes ahead and loads it up and starts the kernel driver so that it can talk uh, and get detailed information from the system. Another thing, which you may be blinking, you'll miss it, but another thing, when I double click on that and I run it, it actually drops out the Process Explorer 64.exe. And then when I close it, that goes away as well. So it's actually dropping out the 64-bit version, running it on the 64-bit version, and then deleting it when I close the binary. Right? So let's go look at its resources for this interesting little binary. So open up them. You won't have Process Explorer on your machines. I just forgot to put it as a prerequisite. But basically, if I open up Process Explorer, and I can go to the resource directory if I want, and you can see there's a whole bunch of different things, and they've got different names on some of them. So this, for one, has name bin res. So you see this first entry, it has the most significant bit set to 1. That means the rest of this entry, the 1D20, is an offset to this name. The name is bin res. I can expand all that, and I can go down and find all these particular resources and all that. But the view I really like is the resource editor. So I can expand that bin res and click right here. And now I've got, well, that looks very much like a executable file, right? So this binary resource is some well-formed executables. If I really wanted, I could, you know, figure out where the EFLA new is, and I could, you know, figure out what the, whether it's 64 or 32 and all that stuff. But the easier way is just you can start right-clicking on these resources, and you can click Save Resource Raw, and this will just dump out this raw binary to disk, and then I can just open it back up again in CFF Explorer. Test.exe. Question mark? I don't think I can use question mark, but no. All right, so now I can go open that. Wait. Oh, test folder too. All right, so test.exe, it's a 32 bit executable. I can go look at its you know, headers and stuff, go see if it has debug information. I could go look up where it was originally compiled and stuff like that. That would give me probably a better idea of which particular file this is. So if you want to do that, you can play around with that. Just go online and Google Process Explorer, download it, and pop it open. But this is pretty much all I wanted to cover with resources. Um, like I said, it's going to be this kind of tree structure. You've got different branches, can hold different resources. It's commonly used for, for uh, icons and stuff like that. That's the most common place you'll see it for, for Microsoft files, certainly. And then in the case of malware that wants to contain extra functionality and bring it around with it. Uh, you know, they can obviously just hard code offsets into their code. They're like, I know that I embedded my, you know, resource, this RVA within my file, and they can just access it that way as well. But this provides a nice, you know, clean interface to use programmatic support for pulling out stuff. And this is what the Stuxnet people did with uh, embedding all their DLLs that they want to inject, embedding all their exploit code. So they read out a resource, now they've got their exploit code, now they you know, send it to the printer spooler, uh, do that buffer overflow, and so forth. A quick so, question. Go for it. Uh, yep. With those two embedded executables, so if I watched your desktop closely enough, so what it was doing was actually extracting one of those and actually writing it as a file out to the desktop yes, directory, right. and then like you know calling a system execute on that. Yes, basically. Yep. So you were talking about how when I run Process Explorer, all of a sudden a new thing called Proc X 64-bit shows up. All right. Anyways, yeah. To your question, Craig, um, Process Explorer basically is dropping out one of those um, executables and uh, run, invoking the 64-bit because it can see that it's on a 64-bit system right now. And this is going to be a problem for continuing on. Talk from the side. Here we go. 
Resiliency. So that's pretty much it for uh, resources as far as uh, we want to cover. Any other questions on resources? See, now I'll actually have to follow the slide. So is that a common technique that they use? I don't know that I would necessarily call it common because a lot of malware isn't as big and complicated as Stuxnet and things like that are. So they don't typically, especially in the Stuxnet case, it was very much um, trying to jump air gaps and things like that. So they knew that they couldn't, you know, the more common technique is that, you know, you download the modules that you need as you need them, assuming you have internet connectivity, right? But when you're trying to jump air gaps and move around behind the scenes, you got to keep everything with you. And so that's one way to do it. There is just regular, general, uh, you know, um, what's the word? organized crime type malware that does this as well. It's just, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a common technique. Right. There is a game. Well, there isn't a game entry for resources right now, actually, because uh, I want to get something decent before I, you know, I could just slap down something, but uh, I want to find something that's actually worth looking at. So, haven't thought of anything that's worth looking at yet for resources to, to randomize. Yeah. Uh, 